2022 is a huge year for PC gamers. There's tons of new releases, big and small, that are worth your time, and we decided to compile a list of them. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on GameRanks, the top 50 new PC games of 2022. Starting off with number 50, it's Solstice, a game that looks kind of like Dark Souls with a slightly more near automata pace. There's actually more than meets the eye to this one. See, the trick is you as a player will be managing two characters. One is oriented towards attack and one is oriented towards healing and defense. It sounds unique and I'm interested to see exactly what it means. Art style, world, and story all seem check, check, check. The two characters, two sisters, binded together to get revenge. Which, who doesn't like a good revenge game? Solstice has a TBA launch date. We'll keep you updated as to when it's landing. And number 49 is The King of Fighters 15. Yes, this is a very long-running series. And it's always been a very good series, too. This is the first one to use Unreal Engine. And this is a series that's just going strong. It seems to keep getting tighter and better. Their team-based gameplay is fantastic. And the latest entry is a great example of it. Obviously, this game is already out. Of course, I recommend it. It's a great game. Worth every penny. And number 48 is a game called Plan 8, an exosuit MMO shooter, not unlike Warframe at its very core. It has a couple of different advantages, though. Uh, productions being led by Soon Ki Lee, who is the art director on Black Desert Online. It is Pearl Abyss's first shooter, and we haven't seen a whole lot about it. However, it's theorized to be coming this year. We have our fingers crossed, because honestly, Pearl Abyss puts out some pretty great stuff. I'm interested to see them venture into something else. And of course, we'll keep you updated on Plan 8 as we find out more. And number 47 is Martha is Dead, a first-person psychological thriller set in 1944, Italy. The plot of the game is that you are the twin sister of a woman named Martha who is found dead, obviously, and you not only deal with the traumatic loss, but you also investigate the death. This has some beautiful graphics, Italian dialogue for maximum authenticity, and frankly a great aesthetic. This game tells a great story and is worth your time. And number 46 is Nightingale, a very different looking game, revealed at the Game Awards last December. It's a survival slash crafting game set in a truly bizarre world that just goes completely out of its way to be something totally unlike anything I have ever seen in the survival slash crafting genre. You can literally build a town in this game and then you have to defend it from all these truly bizarre, sometimes even disgusting looking creatures. It's frankly something I'm really excited to play. It's something that just looks so unbelievably different and I'm excited to play it when it releases in early access sometime this year. At number 45 is Star Trek Resurgence, a telltale game style game created by Dramatic Labs, which is a new company which has more than 20 former telltale writers, developers, designers, artists, and producers. They claim that it's going to obviously be familiar to telltale's normal style of gameplay, but with some new additions and refinements. I don't know exactly what that means yet. It does look interesting. It's also not an episodic game. It's gonna be a full ass entire Star Trek story, which I'm looking forward to playing. And number 44 is Oxenfree 2 Lost Signals. Now, I was a huge fan of the original Oxenfree. It's linear, but also non-linear style of gameplay and fantastic graphics. Really made this a fun, dialogue-driven, descendant of the point-and-click adventure game. This one takes place five years after the first game in Riley's hometown, where stuff becomes similarly messed up to the first game. I'm excited. I have wanted more oxen free for a while now. At number 43, and this is a really big one for me, uh, Dead Space is being remade, and Motive, the game's developers, said we won't really be sharing anymore until next year, which is a, a, an implication that we could actually be getting the game this year. I don't know. I am going to cross my fingers, because if there is one thing I really, truly want, it's to go through the Dead Space remake. This is a game series that I absolutely love, most of. Even a lot of parts of Dead Space 3, but Dead Space 1 and 2 are just phenomenal games. In terms of narrative horror where you actually have the ability to fight the monsters and <clears throat> in space i do not think there is a better game i just don't i think that the game also holds up today so to see them update it it's gonna have to be a pretty big jump with a lot of it and i'm excited to see how that goes 
And number 42 is Arc Raiders, a free-to-play cooperative third-person shooter with a very 1970s-looking aesthetic. Has you and a crew scavenging, using tools, using gadgets, and of course, fighting an enemy called Arc, which is a quote-unquote ruthless mechanized threat to sending from space. It's a game that looks pretty sweet, honestly. Granted, it's been pretty limited in what they've shown us, but it's a pretty-looking game. And number 41 is Stranger of Paradise, a retelling of the very first Final Fantasy game in a kind of Dark Souls-y type format. It's an action RPG that will be, according to the developers, a brutal take on the Final Fantasy series, and I think that's a very good idea. Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja are helming the development of this one, and frankly, it could be something that is incredibly good. We're also not too far away from release. This one's landing on March 18th, and it's one that I am definitely going to play. And number 40 is Pal World. Pal World is an open world multiplayer survival crafting game that incorporates elements of Pokemon into a shooter crafting survival monster hunting game that just, I mean, I'd hesitate to call it unique because I immediately feel like it looks like a Pokemon game, but Pokemon has not done a survival crafting game. And also the mechanics look completely different than any Pokemon game I've ever seen. And on top of that, the action actually looks a lot more fun than your average survival crafting game. This is one that has uh, some definite potential to be more than the sum of its parts. We'll see when it comes out sometime this year. And number 39 is the Uncharted Legacy of Thieves collection, which gives you both Uncharted 4 and Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Now, these are both great games, and I'm excited to play them on PC personally. I mean, what is there really to say? These are some of the biggest action adventure games with the best set pieces and wild winding stories. Of course we're going to play them on PC. And number 38 is The Outer Worlds 2, which despite the fact The Outer Worlds 1 came out on all of the systems, after Microsoft's acquisition of Obsidian, a lot of people thought Outer Worlds 2 would still come out on other systems, but it does not look like that's the case. The first game is incredible. It's such a great focused, maybe smaller in scale, but better in quality Fallout 4 competitor. And I'm excited there's a sequel to it. It sucks that you're going to have to buy an Xbox in order to play it, but it's probably going to be worth it. At number 37 is Hollow Knight's Silk Song, the upcoming sequel to 2017's Hollow Knight. Now, if you're not familiar with the original, it's a Metroidvania. It was a really gorgeous hand-drawn adventure that had a dark tone and was really just a great example of the genre. This one's expanding on it. This one features a different protagonist with different powers. And although we don't know when it's coming out, we will absolutely be giving Hollow Knight Silk Song a spin when it does. And number 36 is Sons of the Forest, the sequel to The Forest. This one looks like it's going to go ahead and be similar in concept, except for you are going to be some kind of a trained fighter. So there's probably going to at least be more robust combat. But other than that, there's not a lot of information about it. And number 35 is Kerbal Space Program 2. We've talked about this game quite a bit. It's been in a long development cycle with a different developer than the original game that looks to honor the original while adding a lot to it. Honestly, I'm pretty excited for this because it looks like they really have the right idea while incorporating all of the original's features as well as propulsion methods, multiplayer, colonies, and interstellar travel. Stuff that should make the experience very good. This one has an estimated release date of sometime this year. We will be playing it when it hits. And number 34 is Lost Ark, a MMO action RPG where you customize a character, you have a bunch of unlocks, and you do a lot of exploration and fighting of enemies. I think what stands out about this is its isometric perspective. It actually uses Unreal Engine 3, but looks pretty darn good, especially considering it's running on old tech. I'm not going to say to you that this is some kind of particularly unique game, but people like it a lot, and I think that makes it worth checking out at the very least. It is already out. It's free to play, so go check it out. And number 33 is Scorn, a game we have seen in various incarnations through the years. Originally announced way back in 2014, this is a game 
that I can remember talking about a lot. It's just a different looking game. It sort of started out looking like a uh, 1990s Tool album cover, and it's developed into a more quote-unquote biopunk aesthetic, where everything's alive, your guns are even technically organic matter. It's an interesting looking game, and it's intended to be non-linear. That is coming in October this year, and we're looking forward to it. And number 32 is the Outlast Trials, the third Outlast game, but not Outlast 3. Outlast 3 is still a project that's being worked on. This serves as a prequel to the first two Outlasts, depicting events that are related to them, but taking place during the Cold War. This is one that got delayed due to the pandemic. It was supposed to come out last year, probably going to come out this year. And number 31 is Diplomacy is Not an Option, a game that's been in early access for about a month now. I want to call this a strategy game slash city planner slash tower defense that kind of lifts all of the best ideas from all of those things and incorporates them into one strategy game that I would call pretty damn fun. This game has a demo out. I'd highly recommend checking that out to see if it's something you'd like. If that description sounds good, though, I have a feeling it's one that you would. Diplomacy is not an option is one that would. At number 30 is Synced Off Planet, a co-op companion shooter where you form teams, go up against enemy teams, and the unique aspect of this is that there are companion classes which you can deploy in combat. Um, not only do you have matches where you're playing against other people, there's also a story about the downfall of society and Synced Off Planet looks like an interesting one landing sometime this year. At number 29 is Stray, an open world cat game, which we've actually seen in a couple of different forms over the last few years. It started off as a game called HK Project. It's basically an adventure game where you play as a cat in a world where there are no people. There's just robots, and the cat's looking to return to his family. There's puzzle solving, cat-oriented traversal, and of course, a narrative. At number 28 is Terminator Dark Fate Defiance, which is a real-time strategy game set in the Terminator Dark Fate universe, which is one of the various Terminator timelines. Obviously, the point is to stop the machines from killing off humanity. I mean, you're probably familiar with the old Terminator premise at this point, but this takes place in the future, and Terminator Dark Fate Defiance is coming out sometime in 2022. And number 27 is Homeworld 3, a sequel to Homeworld 2, which came out way back in 2003. Obviously a completely dormant series for an extremely long period of time. Homeworld 3 is a real-time strategy game that really looks to update all of the aesthetics of Homeworld 2. And on top of that, it has an extensive solo campaign. Now, the graphics have been significantly updated, and it looks like a real experience. I really like what Homeworld 3 looks like, and I look forward to playing it in quarter four. And number 26 is Evil Dead the Game, a survival horror game that's kind of Evil Dead as Left for Dead in some ways. We don't know really a whole lot about it other than it looks really good. It's got PvP and PvE and a skill tree. Evil Dead the Game is slated for release May 13th. At number 25, it's Warhammer 40k Dark Tide, which to sum up very quickly is the 40k version of Vermintide. Essentially, you'll have four players cooperating to defeat waves of enemies, but apparently the experience, while like Vermintide, is apparently going to be a little less melee oriented. That makes sense given the change in setting. Warhammer 40k Dark Tide comes out sometime this year. And number 24 is Evil West, a gory, sort of myth-legend-oriented Wild West game that kind of takes the Wild West and turns it into something that feels kind of Diablo-esque. I'm pretty excited for it. It's a good idea, and if it's executed well, Evil West is definitely going to be uh, a big one. And number 23 is Total War Warhammer 3, obviously the third Warhammer entry in the Total War series. It brings us, of course, the Total War turn-based strategy and real-time tactics gameplay that we're used to from the Total War games at this point. It's not necessarily that this game brings a lot new to the table in terms of mechanics, but content-wise, lots of new stuff. And the campaign has been regarded as way better than the second. I overall think it's a really good entry to the series, and you should check it out now. 
At number 22 is Sniper Elite 5, which of course is the next entry in the premier sniping series out there. This one has you sniping, fighting, stealth across a bunch of big maps in France as you take on the Nazis. We don't have a release date for Sniper Elite 5, but we will be playing it when it hits. At number 21 is Marvel's Midnight Suns, a tactical RPG that incorporates various characters from Avengers, X-Men, and Runaways. It comes to us from the developers of XCOM, and that is exactly what it needs to be. This is a very good idea. Taking various superheroes and mutants from the Marvel Universe and making a tactical RPG in the vein of XCOM, I'm completely there for it. We don't have a date, but allegedly it's coming out this month. I would kind of guess that given they haven't given us a date it may be a little bit later but probably not a lot and number 20 is state of decay 3 it's been quite a while since we saw the previous game which came out in 2018 and 2 was actually a pretty big jump over state of decay 1 probably the biggest addition that has been confirmed is zombie animals and that might be pretty wild considering the way that the world works in this game we don't have a date but supposedly coming out this year at number 19 is Boundary, a tactical space shooter where you have zero gravity firefights in a team versus team scenario. It's a pretty cool idea. There was a demo that I unfortunately missed, but I've been really interested in this since they announced it. In a lot of ways, you see kind of Call of Duty style shooting in a situation where you've got a bunch of debris flying all over the place and there's obviously no gravity. The outdoor firefights look a little more exciting to me than the indoor ones, but either way, I am definitely looking forward to playing this one and I think you should definitely give Boundary a look. And number 18 is Company of Heroes 3, a real-time strategy game set in the Italian and North African areas during World War II and gives us a lot of interesting new mechanics as well as improves on the terrain and structure destruction system. It's been a while since the first Company of Heroes and this looks like a pretty big update to it. Apparently it's coming out late this year. And number 17 is Ghostwire Tokyo, an action-adventure game we've seen a pretty fair amount of interesting stuff happen around, but they've managed to keep what's going on fairly secret. We've gotten little bits of info and various visuals. Essentially, we know that it's a detective story. You've got most people in Tokyo have just randomly disappeared. There's ghosts, and you're investigating what happened. Ghostwire Tokyo is landing March 25th. And number 16 is Crimson Desert, an open-world action-adventure role-playing game coming to us from Pearl Abyss. We already talked about a shooter that they're making. This is a little bit closer to what we're used to from them. This was originally planned as a prequel to Black Desert Online, but involved into a bigger, more unique project. Apparently, this one is a little different, although it, it shares some more similar mechanical and aesthetic things with Black Desert Online. It seems like it might be a little more focused on story. We don't know when that's coming out, but we will see it later in the year. And number 15 is Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. For all the fans of James Cameron's Avatar that have been waiting desperately on the edge of their seat for a, an Avatar video game, this is one of those games where I have to mention it because it better be good. Because if it's not, it's very obviously just trying to get the name Avatar in front of people before they start releasing more movies. It's an open world action adventure game developed by Massive Entertainment who has, just to be clear, put out some pretty good games in the past. The Division specifically comes to mind, particularly after they had worked on it for a while. I feel like it's always worth mentioning stuff like this. Um, even though I don't want to pretend that I am hyped for it, I will say that given what it is, it basically has to be very good. And they probably know that. So there's a decent chance they're actually going to take a real stab at it, which is good. I don't know exactly when Avatar Frontiers of Pandora is coming out, but good or bad, I'm certainly going to be paying attention to it. And number 14 is Redfall, a game that Arcane Studios is working on. And from the looks of it, it seems like it's going to be a pretty big departure. It is an open world action adventure shooter with single player and co-op. There's four different characters you can play as. And the idea is you're in a town called Redfall and you're fighting vampires. This seems like something that Arcane could probably put a really interesting twist on. No real word as to if we're going to have the same kind of traversal powers or 
combat powers as in previous arcane games, but it's reasonable to expect some variation event. Redfall is hitting in the summer, and I'm really looking forward to it. And number 13 is Gotham Knights, which is not a continuation of the Arkham games. However, we'll probably play a lot like the Arkham games. Basically, you play as the various mentees of Batman investigating his death. Gotham Knights doesn't have a date yet, but I would say it's reasonable to expect it to land this year. It's been a few years in development. And number 12 is A Plague Tale Requiem, a direct sequel to A Plague Tale Innocence, continuing the story of the two characters in it as they continue to flee from the plague, hoping to find an island that apparently has the key to saving Hugo. Now, the first game, great story, maybe a little short. It seems like this one might be going to fix the length thing. This is apparently a 16-hour game, which is a bit longer, a little more satisfying. I'm interested to see where they take the story because I really enjoyed playing. Plague Tale Innocence, Requiem's landing sometime this year. And number 11 is Frostpunk 2. Obviously, the first Frostpunk is a game about making the least bad choice. It's a city builder slash survival game, and it's a very good one at that. I'm, I'm really excited to see them make a sequel, attempting to do the same idea at a much larger scale. We don't have a release date, but we expect it to land this year. And number 10 is Dying Light 2 Stay Human, which basically took what was done in the first game and expanded on it significantly. The parkour in this game, for instance, is amazing. Really fluid and just fun to play around with outside of the fact you're in like a zombie open world game. And it finally seems like that really has a good reason to exist. Like the nighttime cycles, if you can manage to parkour all the time, you can avoid zombies pretty well. Just stay on the tops of buildings, on tops of stuff. And it's at its most fun when you're doing exactly that. Not that it's not fun to fight zombies. Really, it's just a great game. Good story, great mechanics. Worth your time. And number nine is Sifu, an action beat-em-up which has a very specific kung fu style and over 150 unique attacks. When the player dies in the game, they're resurrected and age several years. That is basically the life system in the game. It's really a cool game and you should try it out if you haven't already. And number eight is God of War, which is really just a fantastic rejoining into the God of War universe, seeing an older Kratos who's now a father, dealing with different issues, but still in the most brutal possible way. This game made its way onto Windows in January. It's fantastic. There is no reason not to play this game. We love this game. And number seven is Atomic Heart, a game that we've been paying attention to for quite a while now. It's primarily a first-person shooter, but has some action RPG elements. It's really got a Bioshock feel to it, and takes place in an alternate reality, Soviet Union in 1955. The plot is, in the 1930s, the USSR made robots that actually allowed them to defeat Nazi Germany, you know, early. But things kind of get out of hand because there is an internet and an artificial intelligence in an organic tissue merging plot amidst. It's something I'm really looking forward to playing, and it comes out in the latter half of this year. And number six is The Day Before, a massively multiplayer shooter set in a post-pandemic America where you've got infected people craving flesh and survivors craving regular food. This is a very realistic New York post-pandemic, and I'm excited to play this one, even if it's just for exploring the world itself. This one releases June 21st. I'll be paying attention. And number five is Hogwarts Legacy, an action RPG set in the wizarding world in the late 1800s. You'll play as a student at Hogwarts and you'll not only attend classes, but you will also go on various quests to defeat various baddies. Hogwarts Legacy is coming sometime this year. And number four is Forspoken, an action RPG developed by Luminous Productions. Now, Square Enix has touted this as a narrative-driven adventure, but it's very obvious to me that the reason this sets itself apart is the parkour. It's third-person parkour. You're traversing landscapes very quickly, very fluidly. It looks really cool. I'm interested in the story because if it does end up being as intriguing as the gameplay itself, this is going to be a game to beat. going to be released on May 24th, so check out Forspoken.
And number three is Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which is sort of an adjacent game to Borderlands. It plays very similarly, but is set in an entirely fantasy environment with more fantasy-oriented weapons and actions, and obviously a plot. It's a game I'm actually really looking forward to. The Borderlands style of humor will work really well in a fantasy environment, I think, and there's a lot of big-name talent, like Will Arnett is playing the bad guy. It's gonna be a good game. I'm looking forward to it. And number two is Starfield, the next open world game from Bethesda. I'm excited for this because it brings the trademark Fallout slash Elder Scrolls style gameplay into a totally new environment, space. Personally, I'm excited for this. I'm not excited that they're continuing to use the creation engine, but whatever. Maybe they've brought it up to par. We'll see. That's the one bit of trepidation I have for it, though. Everything else about this, I absolutely want to play. Starfield's landing November 11th. And finally, at number one is Elden Ring. Now, if you haven't played Elden Ring, it's probably, despite the fact being released so early in the year, I have to imagine going to be a strong contender for Game of the Year. This one's landed, and it's it's probably as big of an advance in open world games as Breath of the Wild, because it does so many things differently and in a way that's enjoyable and mysterious and just feels like you actually have a reason to continue exploring. And on top of that, it's a Dark Souls game. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what else to say. You gotta play Elden Ring. It's really good. Couple of bonus games for you. First, Avowed, a new role-playing shooter from Obsidian. There's a new Saints Row game coming this year. I don't know how they're going to possibly outdo any of the original games in terms of absurdity, so I assume it's all going to be graphical upgrades and just a new story based in that goofy world. Destiny 2 The Witch Queen is next, the latest expansion on the ever-expanding Destiny universe. Monster Hunter Rise, which was a game that originally came out on Switch, is a fantastic addition to the Monster Hunter franchise. I'm really happy that we've got it on PC now. Next is Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, which gives us all eight Star Wars movies and whatever you would call the ninth thing. I can't imagine actually wanting to play through the story of that, but it's got all eight of the good ones. I mean, 8 out of 9, that's a pretty good record, honestly. Next is Sonic Frontiers, which we probably would have talked more about in the main video if we knew more about. It's apparently coming this year. It's the first Sonic open world game, and it looks super interesting. Little Devil Inside, which is a game that's been teased for years and years now. It's always intrigued the hell out of us. It's a monster hunting, world exploring type game. Lies of P, which we are mentioning because they're claiming it's coming out in 2022, but I have to imagine 2023. Just keep that in mind. It's a Dark Souls game starring Pinocchio, which is the most absurd thing you'll hear today. However, looks very intriguing, actually. Next is Arc 2. I have to imagine that one's going to be a 2023 as well, but it's also worth keeping an eye on. And finally, Stalker 2, Heart of Chernobyl, because, well, world events probably will be causing a delay on that one. Still, it's a new Stalker game, and wow, do I want to play it. That's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. As always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter, Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.